This is a production of Cornell University. So I'll talk a little bit about myself and what led me to apply for the Dreer in the first place, um, why I chose urban agriculture, and then I'll talk about Rosario, Argentina, and Cuba, where I spent most of my time, or, and then we'll tie it up with some lessons from these places. So first, a little bit about me. Um, I grew up with a hardworking single mom that worked very hard to put a good meal on the table every night, um, and I every day came home and was so excited to sit with her and to talk about my day and to eat a great meal. Um, and as I grew older, I realized that not everybody gets that. And as I learned more about, um, <laughs> it's a little nervous. <laughs> um, okay. Um, and as I grew older, I realized that not everybody gets that. And the inequities in the food system became a focus of mine as I grew older. And um, so. I came to Cornell and wanted to learn more about the specific horticultural principles behind food production so that I could apply them to um, my work in, in food justice as an adult. So why urban agriculture? Um, while I was at Cornell, I became really interested in urban agriculture in particular because I saw it as a way to really focus on food deserts and inequities in, this, in the food production system. And in my research, I, I knew that there were a number of um, positive things that urban agriculture did for communities, aside from just making green space. Um, the first is it provides an economic stimulus. And this happens in a number of ways. One is that you know if you have families that are farming in the city, there's a lot of little micro enterprises that develop. So maybe somebody's going to make compost. Somebody else is going to maybe bring in vermicompost. Somebody else is going to do marketing and packaging. Um, so it provides a lot of local economic development, which is really great. Um, more, most obviously, it provides green space, um, spaces for recreation. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, places for recreation and community gathering. Um, but there are a lot of, you know, you take abandoned lots and bring in more economic and agroecological principles to those places. Um, obviously, biodiversity is a big benefit and um, the microclimate that's created can help to really cool cities as well. Um, this um, last part is the, the social piece. So not only does it green spaces and provide economic stimulus to a, to a community, but it brings communities together. And in a lot of cities all over the world where urban agriculture is a, a movement, um, it's really socially inclusive. It's, it usually involves a lot of discriminated and marginalized people, a lot of women, um, older workers, disabled people, maybe people who have come to a new city and they don't have access to purchasing power or capital. Um, so it's, it's a social network and a social net for people. So with all of that research I, you know, and knowledge that I had about urban agriculture, I really wanted to experience it firsthand. Um, so with the generous support of Marvin, who was my advisor as an undergrad. Um, he really encouraged me to apply so that I could um, develop as a young urban agriculturalist. So in my research, as I was applying for the Dreer, Rosario, Argentina kept coming up over and over again, a place that I had never heard of, and maybe most of you haven't either. Um, it's a city of about one million, just a few hours north of Buenos Aires. And uh, go ahead. Um, and <coughs> as I w was reading more and more about it, I, I realized that it it seemed like a very well established system. Um, there were, seemed like a very strong network of farms. It was very well documented in academic literature. Um, and not only were the articles about Rosario really interesting, but articles that pointed to other countries' programs in Latin America, always referred back to Rosario. So it seemed like a really good model for urban agriculture. Um, and the RUAF is the Resource Centers for Urban Agriculture and Food Security. And that was one of the main sources that I used when I was trying to figure out where I wanted to go. Um, a lot of really great articles and research that have been done on urban farms. Um, and they're really committed to poverty reduction. So I was really interested in what they had to say. and they really praised the work that was done in Rosario. 
Um, and lastly, I saw that they had won the Dubai International Award for Best Practices, which was an award that the United Arab Emirates and the UN conceived to award communities that were doing work to support the greening and um, re-envisioning of green spaces, or making green spaces and making communities more environmentally sustainable. So it seemed like a good choice. So some backstory on Argentina to put the program in context is that um, the, <laughs> the history of Argentina is so complicated that when I was trying to make this slide, I had actually a really difficult time. Um, but these are the, the big bullet points. So for, um, it's in 1976 through 83, there was a pretty powerful dictator who, um, and that period was known as the Dirty War. And during that time, um, there were a lot of atrocities and the economic development that had sort of prospered for three decades was overturned in a matter of a few short years. Um, so quickly, after the dictatorship, the, company, or the country was um, pushed into a period of you know, high unemployment, large f you know, food insecurity. Um, and that period, they were, you know, from 84 to 89, the country was really recovering from the dictatorship, but they didn't, it took, it's, I think they're still recovering in a lot of ways. Um, so in the mid 90s, a few farmers that had migrated from the north and the inland of Argentina started to form gardens in the, in the outskirts of Rosario. Um, and that was a difficult time. There were a lot of, um, in the, there were a lot of farmers who migrated by the thousands in the late 80s and early 90s. And when they arrived in Rosario, they found that there wasn't as much work as was promised, and they didn't really have a way of earning capital. Um, and so slums developed, and it was in those slums that they started gardening. And then in 2001, there was another dramatic economic um, uh, depression that was begun by the peso, which was devalued overnight to about a quarter of its worth. Um, so after that, the Argentine, <coughs> the municipality in Rosario saw what was happening in these, in these uh, marginalized areas where people were gardening, and they immediately sanctioned it and said, yes, this is a legitimate use of space and we want to do everything we can to support it. So, um, so then they had the, the support of the municipality and very quickly, um, by 2004, when the Dubai International Award was given, there were 10,000 families that were involved in over 750 community gardens. So blew up very quickly um, and really provided support to families during the economic crisis. Um, so the structure of the program now, as it was when I was there, is that there's a seed bank, which is right downtown, and the seed bank is called Nyanderoga, which is Guarani, um, one of the indigenous languages, and it means our house. So that's the seed bank. Um, which is run by one of the founders. And then there are seven Parque Huertas, and the Huertas are large orchards that were created um, in the late 2000s. So they moved from a system of small little gardens to a few of those, and then also these very large Huertas, which I think the average Huerta is probably about three or four acres. Um, and then those are cooperatively run with probably 20 to 30 farmers per Huerta. Um, and then the produce is sold at the gardens. It's also brought to market stands all over the city. Um, and then the, the municipality helped to build a structure um, in downtown Rosario that processes all of the extra vegetables that they want to sell to businessmen, you know, like salads on their wait break from work. Um, and they also use medicinal herbs um, and botanical to create like lotions and soaps, things like that, to bring in a little bit of extra money. Um, so those are the big p points. And then the capacity building I wanted to mention because um, what they do every Monday is, um, that's actually, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, every Monday there's a capacity building session at the municipality. And at each of the huertas there's a farmer that is um, given the role they call them promotores, and that promoter basically is the liaison between the municipality and all of the farm workers. So they try to keep it as horizontal as possible. They really provide training for the promoter, um, and that training could be anything from making, you know, uh, fermented herb biopesticides to 
how to incorporate vermiculture, all these things. And then the promoters work with their farmers to, to achieve that. Um, and those capacity building sessions took place every Monday. And I was there. Um, that's part of my role. So I, when I was in Argentina, I participated in those sessions every Monday. And for the most part, I was in the role of farmer, just kind of at the sessions, learning as much as I could, um, mostly using that as a time to work on my Spanish and figure out which words I knew and which words I needed to study. Um, and, uh, and then also the rest of the days of the week, Tuesday through Friday, I was assigned to one of the Parque Huertas, and I just farmed every day with, with the, the Huerteros. So. And this is the Huerta that I worked at. It was called La Tablada, um, and it was about a mile outside of the city center. What you can't see is a slaughterhouse that was like right here. Um, <laughs> and I won't talk about that right now, but it was <laughs> um, a daily experience at the farm. Um, so we can, um, so I, there were two other interns that worked with me in Rosario. That was pure coincidence. I arrived the same week that a young man from France and a young man from Brazil arrived, um, which was really nice. It gave a lot of structure to the internship since there were three of us. So they really went through a good effort to make sure that we were at every meeting and, um, were able to really participate in everything that happened with the program of urban agriculture. So we did a lot of things on the farm, many of which I hadn't actually done before, even though I have loved farming for so long. Like we saved seeds almost on the daily. Um, so this is us saving some, they were called zapachito, like, little, like a little Argentine squash seed. Um, so I learned a lot about different methods for seed saving. Um, and then we would, this is a, just a, a little picture of lots of different seeds that we had saved, herbs and beans. Um, and then one of the things that the program did really well was really market itself and put themselves out in the community to try to tell people and make themselves known as much as possible. Um, so this was an event by the river one day, um, and it was actually a three-day thing where we had 50 farmers and just, I think it was, I mean, many different sections of tables where the variety of fruits and vegetables was available. And if this were here, it maybe wouldn't seem as radical, but in Argentina they eat a lot of meat and a lot of pasta, and the idea of eating vegetables, even next to your meat, is not as, like, it's, it's not, the, we don't, it's not thought of in the way that we think of it here. Um, so this was a really new movement. It almost felt like Rosario was experiencing the kind of, in Argentina in a whole, um, was where we were with vegetarianism and you know fresh vegetables organic produce it was almost like going back 10 years or maybe even 15 so so that was interesting to to feel that you know people still asking like what's a vegetarian or what is like how do i cook this so there was a lot of educational opportunities um, while we were there as well so the other country that i visited was cuba which um <laughs> was a really obvious choice for me. I knew that if I was gonna study urban agriculture in Latin America, that I ha had to go to Cuba. Um, so I saved it for last. Um, and while we're looking at this map, so the, w when I was in Rosario, I worked every day with the program of urban agriculture, <laughs> which was housed by the municipality. And that was really positive because it gave me a lot of structure and I was able to ask all the questions I needed to and see as much as I wanted to. But it also was kind of difficult because there were days maybe when I really wanted to work or go to the farm, but they didn't want to, so we didn't, um, or something was closed. or um, So my schedule really depended on their schedule. So in Cuba, because the garden, I mean, there are obviously a lot of gardens in Havana, um, but there are gardens all over the, the island in different cities, so I took a really different approach in Cuba. And so I started in Havana, I flew into Havana, and I took an overnight bus to Guantanamo, which is down here, and I stayed in this city called Baracoa, and then I made my way back um, through different cities. So we stayed in Santiago de Cuba, Camaway, um, Ciego de Avila, Via Clara, all the way down, and then I ended up over here as well. Um, so, so really different experience, which was really great. Okay, so in order to put <laughs> this in context, um, 
very quickly. Um, I think many of you probably know that in Cuba, for 100 years, sugar was king, and um, there was many of the forests were cleared to make way for a monocrop of sugar, which was their major export crop for a very long time. And we all know this guy, or I think many of you know this guy, which is Norman Borlaug. Um, so he initiated the Green Revolution, obviously, after he grew his short varieties of wheat. Um, and Cuba was very quick to adopt the practices that he and his teams um, really pushed, and it, it worked really well with sugar. And so Cuba very quickly became highly mechanized. They were extremely dependent on pesticides, um, herbicides, in order to have their um, export crop. Um, and actually, even though it was working really well, there was this group of scientists that were very skeptical of what Cuba was doing and of how um, they were so blindly following these proce processes or uh, practices. Um, and a small group of scientists actually began studying IPM and, um, in, the, in the 80s, which I thought was very cool. And so when the Soviet collapsed, there, Cuba was actually poised very well to deal with it for a few reasons. One is that they had already been doing research in these areas of alternative agriculture or, um, you know, in more natural, like, cultural practices. Um, but also, something that I learned, which I thought was so incredible, is that despite the fact that Cuba only has 2% of Latin America's population, they have 11% of its scientists, um, which is still true today. And so they were they were able to harness all of that knowledge and, and um, infrastructure to do research and development and just apply it to this. So when the Soviet collapsed, that was 89, literally overnight they lost 80% of their imports and their ability to export. So they lost fuel, they couldn't transport food from the rural areas to the cities. They lost, I think, three quarters of their imported food, um, or of their food, which three quarters of it was imported. And so, um, Cuba had a lot to do in a very short amount of time and with the decreased imports they had to increase food production which was um, just like a startling equation like it's hard to figure out like how they did that and how they um, so part of the way that they did that was that across the whole island not just in the urban areas um, they divided large estates up into smaller parcels and every couple of years those parcels kept getting smaller and smaller so they went from many, many, many thousands, down to 1,000. A few years later, they ended up being, I think, 150 acres or hectares was the max. Um, and, yeah, we can go ahead. So there, as far as urban agriculture in Cuba is concerned, there's four different types of farms. Um, the first is called, um, oh my gosh, <laughs> um, the cooperative farms. So this is um, the most famous example. This is called Vivero a la Mar. Vivero means um, greenhouse, but they just applied it. So Vivero a la Mar is in, um, is in a la Mar, which is one of the suburbs of Havana. Um, it started out as just maybe 20 um, hectares and is now 100 hectares or more. Um, it employs over 200 huerteros and um, and they use the um, organoponico structure, but they also have animals. They make their own vermicompost. They graft their own fruit trees. They um, have grown neem trees, which have proven to be a really awesome form of pesticide. Um, they have, along with the rest of Cuba, have um, remembered old cultural practices, such as you know crop rotation, they use windbreaks, um, all of the stuff that we know about and, and you know, are proponents of. So that's, that's one farm, or version of a farm. Um, and what's, oh, not yet. <laughs> um, so the thing that makes this farm unique is that these, because it's a cooperative, a lot of people come together to work on it and then they share the profits. When you, in Cuba, if you wanted, if you, you, if you knew that there was empty land and you wanted to form a cooperative, you'd go to them and you'd say like, hey, we see that lot, we want it and then they would provide for you the seeds, the market stand, 
um, every input that you could need in the beginning, but then the idea is that over time you're producing your own seed, you have your own animals, everything becomes sustainable. So, The second is the organoponicos. Um, it's just a raised bed um, with organic methods, and but the, a lot of the organoponicos were um, and are state built and run, and so a lot of them are really, really high input. Um, Cuba is really proud of them, and they are the poster child for or, or, ur urban agriculture in Cuba, um, but they're certainly not the, like, the greatest portion of food production, um, but, but they're, they're very beautiful, they're pristine, no weeds, just absolutely gorgeous, um, and they, uh, you find organoponicos in lots of different corners that you wouldn't expect, which is really neat. Um, but the, the takeaway from these is like very, very expensive to build, very high input. Um, and so because of that, despite you know, the fact that other versions of farms maybe are more productive or more um, socially inclusive, this is the version that Cuba always shows the world because this is what they're most proud of. So, um, so this third type of urban farm is an institutional farm, which most of um, this, all of the schools and pretty much most places where people work are run by the government. So factories, um, schools, any kind of government building, if there's land attached to it, often that land is turned into a farm and the people that work at the factories or the buildings are expected to work on the farm to produce food for themselves for lunches, which is an, it's a really cool model. Um, so this is a picture of just at one of the schools. So. The last and my favorite was the parcelas or patios, um, and this was the most common and most effective and important version of urban agriculture in Cuba. Um, but it's not what they're as proud of because it's you know um, it, there's no investment on their part. But the parcelas are very neat. A couple different styles. Um, there's obviously you know if somebody they're called patios partly because a lot of people utilize their patios and use you know, buckets or tires or whatever they can find to plant food there. I included this photo and there's a few more after it because this was my favorite farm that I visited. Um, that was a parcela and it was, you can kind of see there's these buildings here and then there's a road and then this is a pretty steep decline and then it just kind of like cuts off here and there's the sea. So this man's name was Orlando and he lived in one of the homes right across the street um, and had for most of his life. And he kept looking over, and this entire area was just covered in trash. Um, and he, he just looked at it one day and said, like, I'm going to fix that. So he, clear, he spent a year clearing the trash and then spent another year creating these tiers and then started planting. Um, so the next photo is from the other side looking out. So literally, I mean, it just drops off. Pretty precarious location, but so beautiful um, and such a good example of how you can use marginal lands to really um, provide food and beauty for your community. Um, fermenting herbs, super common. Um, I don't remember which herb that was actually, but um, Ortiga. Um, and this is um, Orlando and his son. El, the, Lombricultura right here, this is the vermicompost area. Um, so it was really complete, which was neat. Um, <laughs> this is a really common image. <laughs> we saw these everywhere. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, 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 in, the amazing thing about Cuba, I mean, the gardens were incredible, but what they really represented was this just unfathomable and bottomless imagination um, and the ingenuity and creativity of the Cuban people in so many ways was the most beautiful thing. Um, so this man had bought a bicycle. Um, what a lot of them did was they were able to get these like attachments from Cuba <laughs> that, or from China, excuse me, that um, were pretty cheap. I think that they were coming in on the black market and so people who welded, they would like go to their welder friend and this Chinese like attachment would be molt, like welded onto their bicycle, and then they would build it up. So, um, so this was, you know, a man who went to the urban farm, got stuff in the morning, and then drove around until it was empty. An example of a micro enterprise. <laughs>
um, go back really quick. So the other version of the bike that we would see everywhere was if there was, imagine that this cart is not here, um, or these shelves are not here, and then there's just a bench. Um, so BC taxis everywhere, <laughs> which is really cool. Um, so one of the things I was really surprised to learn about Cuba, um, I think I had revered it for so long, and the gardens for so long, that I imagined that all Cubans supported it and thought it was great. Um, and that's not the case. So within the government, there are two opposing beliefs. One side is the um, people who work in the Office of City Planning and Urban Planning. And then the other side is the people who work for MINAG, the Ministry of Agriculture. The city planning folks really think that, you know, <clears throat> the urban ag in the city centers has been really awesome and helpful, but that, you know, the crisis is over now, so we should use those lands to bring in business. And um, whereas the MINAG people think like, oh, no, no, this is working. This is beautiful. We want to keep this for our communities. And so, I mean, this is the question that I think a lot of people are asking. Um, as far as urban ag goes, you might have connected the dots, but in Rosario and in Cuba, both of these amazing um, networks of urban farms were created out of crisis. And so the idea is how do we maintain them when the crisis is over? Do they just disappear? Were they just helpful for that period of time or can we really make this a permanent fixture in our communities? So the takeaway. Um, the takeaway is that I hope that there's, that we can keep them, that we can not only keep them but that we can bring urban agriculture to cities everywhere um, and to food deserts everywhere, that we can use urban agriculture to make our cities more beautiful and to nourish our communities um, and to create spaces for us to enjoy each other's company. The other takeaway, which was one that I didn't really expect for myself um, because I had mostly focused on um, horticulture and production and um, sort of on the ground stuff was that in both of these cases and in a lot of other cases that I'd seen or heard about when I was in South America or in Cuba, um, government support was really important. The government support is what made both of them possible. Um, and not big government, but the municipalities. And so it was easier to do when I was home, but to really compare like, okay, what, what did the municipality in Rosario and the government of Cuba offer that that made this possible. Um, and there were a lot of different things. One is the, um, you know, they provided economic incentives, for example. So in Rosario, not only did they map the land as they did in Cuba and show where all of the empty urban lots were, but in Rosario, they, um, the municipality raised taxes on urban lands that were unused. So that way, if you had urban land, urban land that you owned and you were not making it available to an urban farmer and you weren't using it yourself, all of a sudden you had to pay a lot more money. Um, so they incentivized urban farming in that way. Um, another important mechanism that mu municipalities use is design. Obviously if a, sp if a community is designed with a space for a garden, there will be a garden. Um, education is an important component as well. Um, the municipality and the Cuban government, they trained farmers um, and they had really large educational communication campaigns where they taught people about urban farming and they taught people about how important nutrition is and, and all of the benefits of having urban farms in their community. Um, so certainly it's possible without municipality support. Um, we see it, we hear of little pockets of it happening um, in our country and abroad, but when you have municipality support or local government support, they can bring together you know, cert different um, stakeholders. So you can have big conversations with, you know, the municipalities, with nonprofits, with the actors, with the urban farmers, with design, with, you know, local un universities. Um, and so I think that, you know, for me, sort of what I've figured out is that um, I want to know more about that. I don't, I, di I didn't know a lot about that before I went to Cuba. And I think that if I'm going to be a person who works now in the US, in my community, to make a stronger urban agriculture network wherever I live, that I want to know about policy because I think that it's really useful um, as a tool to, to making permanent spaces like this. Um,
So I've been looking into graduate work at Tufts School of Nutrition because they have a really cool program that combines applied nutrition with food policy. Um, so I see that as a really good um, thing to sort of add to my, my basket of tools. Um, and I recently co-wrote a grant where I'm working in Providence to build a garden um, on a school which is really exciting and I'll be able to finally apply some of the stuff that I've learned um, at Cornell and abroad. Um, and I just see myself working in marginalized communities um, here in the States. And I'm so grateful that I've had the opportunity to not only practice my Spanish because most of the communities I've been working in are here are um, largely Spanish speaking, um, but I feel really, yeah, this is a good time to, I'm really grateful, um, thank you to the Dreer Committee first because I, I, this experience has been so invaluable and I feel like it really informed me and will continue to inform the way that I um, exist in community in the future. Um, Jonathan Russell and Ellie is not here, but he loves soil and he loves urban soil and has been um, a really great mentor for me as well. Um, Phil McMichael, how many? Anyway, he's awesome and um, his class in international development taught me so much about the historical roots of poverty and food insecurity um, and how we can think about that and frame our lives within that context. And that no undoubtedly also helped me when I was um, abroad and thinking about urban farming. Um, and lastly, I wanna thank my family because they were so supportive throughout this entire year, particularly my husband who, um, provides me just un endless um, joy and support. So thank you all for coming. Um, that's my year, yeah. <laughs>
cornmeal kind of cookie. Um, they're really soft and then they're filled with dulce de leche. So if you haven't had one yet, you can also help yourself to that mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. okay. So how just, uh, in oh, terms yeah. of just the drear, how, yeah. was it, how difficult was it to make all the connections and get where you need to go? Yeah. And, uh, it, it, must have taken a while. it took a long time because I applied in March um, and then I didn't leave till January. And I, by the, when I applied, I had already been emailing people for three or four months. Mm -hmm. So it was a solid year of sending out emails. And I sent out emails to people in so many more cities. And so it also, it was kind of, you know, perfect that the city that responded was Rosario because mm -hmm. it was the, the model. Um, but even still, there... I would get like a one line kind of like, sure, but it wasn't until I was actually there mm -hmm. that I just, I, I basically just like walked into the municipality building and I was like, hi, like, I'm here, I want to, you know, be a part of this, what can I do? And they actually had me um, put together a presentation in Spanish for the entire program, mm -hmm. and, and that was when I was still <laughs> doing my intensive Spanish classes, <laughs> and so I learned Central American Spanish and in Argentina. It's absolutely different. There's like 6,000 words that are different. The pronunciation is different. And I felt like I was a, a toddler all over again. I just like couldn't, you know. So right away I had to, you know, give this big presentation. Um, and it worked. They liked me and they immediately brought me in. So that was... That was like a test? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I felt like it. It was pretty nerve-wracking. Um, but it, it, yeah, so... Um, but I sort of, I mean, they had communicated enough with me that I figured it was, it was going to be a go. But... Mm -hmm. Um, but there, there was minimal communication. I think, at least, I can only speak for a few of the cities, but I, I think that there's definitely this idea that like face-to-face -face is what gets things done. Mm -hmm. um, they don't really, I mean, Cuba had no email culture because most people don't have access to the internet. So that was an absolutely like just walk in and introduce myself to people. How did you find out about Cuba just from newspapers? And yeah, and I had, I had sort of known about Cuba. It was one of those... Um, like beacons, I think, that mm -hmm. I had sort of idolized once I became interested in urban agriculture and also, you know, um, but, but in Cuba, I mean, I knew the agencies, I knew, I even had some names that I had read, but I couldn't get in touch with anybody right. until I was there. Mm -hmm. so, okay. so that was a little bit more like waking up and... So you were like seven months in Argentina or something like that? Seven and, and then... And um, four in... A little, yeah, four in Cuba. Cuba. Mm -hmm. So, could you compare the diet between Argentina and Cuba? Like what the people typically yeah. eat during the day sure. in both places mm -hmm. in the street? Yeah, absolutely. So, in Argentina, they are crazy about cow. Um, <laughs> they're just like eating beef twice a day. Um, so, in Argentina, a typical meal would be like a fried bread of some kind with a big piece of meat and maybe like shaved carrots, like little shaved carrots. <laughs> um, and that really typical, they didn't really eat breakfast, it was a lot of bread. So maybe like a little croissant in the morning with coffee and then um, meat. They ate a lot of pasta too um, because they had a large migration of Italians. Um, like a like late 1800s or early oh, 1900s. So World War II. And World War II, right. So, so I mean a really big pasta culture. Um, and not a lot of vegetables. So in Rosario, I had been working there for five months, and I was at this, I knew, you know, the whole thing. I, I was at this um, event that the farmers put on each year. So it's a big luncheon where the, the farmers, you know, they obviously grow everything themselves, produce it, and they made this huge lunch where they sold tickets. So they sold 100 or so tickets. Um, and a local restaurant every year offers for free to host the, the event. So I'm at this event and helping them and kind of like serving and, and doing some mingling. I took a lot of photos for the program when I was there too because they didn't have um, a lot of good equipment. So that was, so I was there and one of the women who works at the program mentioned to me that it's such a shame that they don't eat the vegetables. And I was like, wait a minute, what? Like, that's what, no, 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 that's what they eat. They grow this and they take it home and eat it. And she was like, no, 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 like they don't like the vegetables. They grow them and sell them and then they buy pasta. And it broke my heart, and, it, and I, I think that's you know that's part of the reason why I'm I'm really interested in nutrition is because I know that there's so many cultural, there's so much more than just you know access that determines what people eat and how healthy they are. Um, so that's Argentina. Cuba was really different after the um, Soviet collapse during the special period, which was the food rationing period, um, which is still going on. It became illegal to for anybody to to kill a cow without state approval. 
So you never see beef, and a lot of meat is really rare. Um, so Cubans will typically eat just rice and beans and then whatever vegetables or herbs that they have. Um, and not in very big portions. And then as Micah said, you know, a lot of bread. Um, the tourist thing is really different though because unless you pay to eat wherever you're staying at your home, then there's this separate network of restaurants that is just for tourists. And in those restaurants, you can get like beef and fish and all these things. And it, it's just like heartbreaking. We didn't even, we, we couldn't go to those places very much just because of the ethical, it just didn't feel right to go and feast and then to walk outside and see Cubans lined up for their bread, you know, just, um, and because they provide so much to the tourists, they leave themselves with just, you know, the vegetables that they grow and, and rice and beans, things like that. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.